Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins for their vote on health care. So I'm wildly disappointed with the entire party. The fact is that we were promised a full repeal of Obamacare. They did not even attempt to pursue a full repeal of Obamacare. And the fact of the matter is that there's a significant gap inside the Republican Party about whether this should even happen or not. There are people who believe that the Obamacare regulations are an affirmative good. There was an attempt to basically leave all the Obamacare regulations in place and just remove the funding mechanism, which would have led to the exacerbation of the death spiral. The truth about health care is this. There are three qualities of health care that you can have. You can have affordability, you can have universality, uh, or you can have quality. And you can have two of those three things, but not all three. Right? You can have universality, affordability, or quality. Two of those two things you can have. And one of the things that's happened with Obamacare is that you've gotten closer to universality, but you haven't gotten any clo closer to either affordability or quality. And the Republican Party seems to be falling into the trap of basically just copying what the Democrats do, except being worse at it. What they actually need to do is relieve the regulatory burden that is driving up the cost of health care, and they need to stop acting as though insurance companies' jobs is actually just to reimburse people for their bad health. If you join up with an insurance company and your health sucks to begin with, you are going to pay more because it's an insurance company, not a charity. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have... Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have some form of backup for people who have pre-existing conditions. I would hope that the social fabric would help fill that in. This is why I'm a big believer in charity and churches and synagogues filling that gap. But what we can't do is suggest, as the Bernie Sanders left does, that health care is an inalienable right, and therefore you can put a gun to my wife's head, she's a doctor, and you can force her to provide care at any cost you want to pay. You can't do that and hope to increase the supply of health care. Health insurance is not health care. They're not the same thing. And anybody who tells you differently is lying or trying to sell you something. Excellent. Go ahead, go ahead. All right, so a couple, of, a couple of notes in response to the Medicare for All shtick. So this is Bernie Sanders shtick, obviously. The problem with Medicare for All is that when people say that it's affordable, this is not affordable to the person who has the Medicare. It is not affordable to the country. In fact, it is so unaffordable to the country that the state of California was a nut job leftist state, just refused to even pass Medicare for All because it would have immediately doubled the debt. As far as the idea that Medicare, that medical care is, is a right, but it's not actually a good or a service. This is a way to make things less plentiful. If you declare things right, but you don't actually incentivize the creation of those things, you don't get more of them. So the South African Constitution has right in there that health care is a right, that housing is a right. The fact is that you don't have good housing or health care in South Africa because just declaring things right does not make them appear. What makes more things appear is a market-based system that creates more doctors, that creates more medical care, that creates more incentive for people to join up. So my wife is a doctor. I mean, she has to go through a thousand years of medical training, and we have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to make her a doctor. The idea that you're going to have the government come in and then dictate the sort of care that she should provide to each particular patient, and then dictate how much she should be paid for that care, is going to lead to a decrease in the number of people who are going into the medical industry, which decreases the level of care overall. This is why I say that it is better to treat things as goods than as rights, because declaring something a right just means that you have the right to steal it from me. But declaring something a good means that you get a market process that leads to lower prices and better care over time. And the big problem we've had before Obamacare is that it was already treated quasi as a right. You had it heavily regulated on the state level. It is continually heavily regulated. The idea that a completely unregulated market is absolute nonsense. The reason that you have employer-based health insurance in the first place was as a response to wage and price controls placed in the aftermath of World War II, and employers began giving health insurance as an actual good, right? They gave it as an actual incentive to their employees. If you had an actual individual-based health insurance market, you bought it just like you bought your car insurance, you would see more and better health care for everyone. Uh, so. I, I'd more want to respond to some of the contentions that Cenk was making about Medicare for all and single-payer health care. Uh, a couple of things. One, when you say we pay for it, that's not technically true. The idea that everybody who's paying into Medicaid paid for it and now they get out what they paid in is obviously not true. It is a redistributive program, and to pretend otherwise is just silly. The people who are paying the payroll taxes are not the people who are taking out through Medicaid. Obviously. Can I just address that super quick? So we are can sick, I ask you, that so can I ask you a question? I have two questions, really, yeah. serious questions. One, what is your ideal tax rate? because it's going to cost a lot of money for a lot of this stuff. And two, what is your ideal level of medical care? Because the fact is that we can spend millions of dollars on people at end of, in end of life care. We can spend millions of dollars on surgeries and preventative care. I mean, it's, healthcare is an expensive business, even under a single payer system, which is why generally you end up with rationing. 
So, what is your ideal level of health care that is provided to everyone, and what sort of tax rate are you proposing to subsidize that? Yeah. All this sounds great, except for the fact that Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security eat up 66% of the federal budget every single year. The idea that all of these socialized medicine countries have it so much better than we do, particularly in terms of cancer care, is a joke. We are still number one in terms of five-year cancer survival rate here in the United States. And when you talk about top, top, uh, top marginal tax rates in the 1950s, there are a couple things that are worth noting. One, that was top individual marginal tax rates, not necessarily the business tax rate. We now have some of the highest corporate tax rates altogether in the industrialized world. And if you would prefer for us to destroy half of the world before we become the only country that didn't have its industrial capacity destroyed, which is what happened in the 1940s, leading to us being the only productive country on planet Earth, essentially, for the next two decades, I'm not with you there. I'm not really in favor of having a giant world war that destroys all industrial capacity across the West so that we're the only people who actually have the capacity to produce anything and just markets that we can provide to. One more, one yeah, more quick ahead. point and then, and sure, then sure. I'll be done with this because we can do healthcare for eight hours here. Um, but two things. One, I'd like to know which tax deduction, when people say tax loopholes, a tax loophole is just a tax deduction that's available to everyone and some people take advantage of it and some people don't. I can't take advantage of certain corporate tax deductions because my business isn't in those businesses, for example. I'm sort of with you in the sense that I'm not in favor of tax deductions. I'm in favor of a lower tax rate and get rid of a lot of the tax deductions because I think that it's ridiculous that we have people gaming the system. That said, I'd like to know which tax deductions you'd like to do away with. And I'd like to know also when you say that corporations pay 10% of the taxes, right, and individuals pay the other 90%. Okay, so that means the taxes are still getting paid to a higher rate than we ever have in our history in terms of the tax revenue to the government. The, the amount of tax revenue to the government right now is trillions of dollars every year. And final point here. You elided this question by saying we can learn stuff from Japan. The standard of care is the entire question when it comes to single-payer health care. That is the entire thing. If people felt like they were going to get the same access to care in a single-payer health care system as they did in a, in a system where they can pay their own way, then we would have no controversy here. But the fact is that rationing is mandated as soon as you start having the government run the healthcare system and decide what level of care people get. So I don't want anyone deciding what level of care that I can get. I don't want anyone else to They don't care about me. They don't know my child's name. They don't know my name. All they know is how much I cost. I mean, Ezekiel Emanuel is at least honest about this. Ezekiel Emanuel comes out and says, listen, I want to die at 70, right? I want to die at 80. That's fine with me. I'd rather die at that. Well, that's good for him. But if I don't want to die at 80 or I don't want my father to die at 80, it's none of his damn business. So yes. Ben, let me just ask the if you can respond you pay, to that too. Is, the problem is when you pay a higher tax rate throughout the course of your life to pay for all of the Medicare that you are talking about, you don't have enough money to pay for Medicare Advantage in many cases. And as far as this idea that, you know, corporations have, they don't have any of your interests at heart. You are a corporation. TYT is it's a corporation. Uh, you have 80 employees. I assume that you're not just a greedy asshole and that you actually would like to help your, your employees from time to time. And you just talked about how under Obama, everything got better with your business. Well, under Obama, he didn't radically escalate taxes. Okay, there was not a radical escalation of taxes under President Obama. And finally, when you, you seem to be identifying a higher tax rate in the 1950s with higher level of growth. So if that's the case, why not just tax everybody at 100% and we can have massive growth from here to eternity? Uh, the, now you're making a strong case for Keynesian economics, which is totally fine, obviously. Uh, the, the problem with Keynesian economics is that it doesn't even work in theory because again, once you go to the logical extreme, which is remove all of the money from the rich people who are saving all their money and give it to all the poor people to buy hamburgers, that doesn't help the economy or spur the economy. What spurs the economy is a higher level. Right. What spurs the economy is the creation of new products and services, and that is only going to be done by people who have exp expendable capital to actually invest in the new products and services that we all enjoy. This is what creates economic growth. It's also worth noting that this, this myth that spending is inherently better for an economy than saving, that's only true if you're talking about somebody who's actually taking the cash and just shoving it into their mattress. Banks are in the business of lending. When they take the money in, they don't just stick it in Al Gore's fake lockbox. They actually lend the money back out to people to actually create new businesses and new products. You had an investor, right? When you started TYT, you were given $4 million by Buddy Romer to start TYT. That's great. That's the way business should work, right? But that money had, it didn't come from a bunch of poor people buying hamburgers. It came from a very, very wealthy guy who gave you money to create a business a lot of people want to patronize. If you want better products and better services, you need more investment in the products and services. The basic name, trickle-down economics. The basic name trickle-down economics is not something that any conservative even proposed. It's a leftist revision of what economics actually is because you're not giving me the money. 
It was my money in the first place, created through voluntary transactions that I had with others. I've not stolen money from either from anyone, neither have you. And the idea that money has to be forcibly taken from you and handed to somebody at the bottom end of the economic spectrum to somehow jog the economy, that may jog McDonald's, but is not going to jog all of the creation of the products and services that make all of our lives much better today than they were 30 years ago in terms of the stuff we have access to. From my mouth to God's yeah. ears, because I don't think they're going to pass anything. <laughs> Uh, because I think that there's a, a high level of incompetence inside the Republican caucus and, and it's pretty fractious. Um, but uh, I, I do want to go back to a couple of points because you actually hit on some major thematic points. You, you talked about roads and the fact that we need roads in order to get to work. This is a point Elizabeth Warren made and obviously a point that President Obama made at the time. I don't think anyone argues that we don't need roads to get to work. The problem is that when you're talking about roads as a percentage of the budget, we are talking about a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the federal budget and of the state budget and even of the local budget. So the idea that you're justifying massive tax rates on corporations or to pay for roads is just intellectually dishonest. It's a tiny, per the stuff that we agree on, the government should spend on, is a tiny percentage of spending, right? It's all the other stuff that we disagree on. As far as the idea that I'm somehow being, you know, uh, dismissive toward people who are buying hamburgers, I'm not. I'm saying the people who are poor need to buy hamburgers to feed their children. They don't have the money to invest in building an iPhone because when you're just trying to get by and you are living in a Walmart subsistence economy, you're using that money to buy the products and services you need to get by. That does not create new products and services that become cheaper over time through competition. You need somebody to make those investments. You, saw, you said this about Glass-Steagall, for example. You said the banks, they might make their own investments. In what? In what? They're not investing in themselves. I mean, they have to take that money and then they have to use it to invest in something else. Places like Apple, places, some that fail and some that succeed. This idea that banks are somehow evils is just not the case unless you are talking about them working in Congress, here you and I agree, working in congruity with a Congress and with a legislature that is attempting to give them kickbacks. Both you and I agree on this. So, and finally, as far as the idea that Republicans pass tax cuts because they're beholden to their donors, okay, and Democrats pass tax increases because the unions give them hundreds of millions of dollars every year, and I don't see Democrats complain about this. Well, I mean, I, when it comes to money and politics, I think that, that that breakdown doesn't really hold. I mean, the fact is that, that President Trump, during the campaign, talked routinely about how he engaged in, in putting money into politics. So, I mean, this is a game that a lot of people are playing. It's, it's kind of a weird question. But uh, as far as the idea that all money should be out of politics, here is the problem. Okay, TYT, I, we both have corporations, and we expound upon politics every single day. And we motivate thousands of people, right, every day on both sides of the aisle. That is effectively an in-kind contribution. Now, I, you campaigned with Bernie Sanders. Did you do it because you expected, that's fine. Did you expect, did you do that because you supported Bernie Sanders or did you do that because you expected some gimme for TYT in return? I assume no. you did it because you supported Bernie Sanders, right? Yes. So, yes. okay, so the point that I am making is to attribute to everyone else bad intent when it comes to political spending and politics, but to yourself, it's totally fine. And when it comes to other media entities that give in-kind contributions on a regular basis through their coverage, this is, when the New York Times, when the New York Times, which is biased to the left, spends an inordinate amount of time and money reporting on Mitt Romney's idiotic stories about how he was in high school and cutting a gay kid's hair in 1932. If you're saying to me that that is less impactful on the political sphere than a corporation, which is a group giving money to a, to a political candidate for purposes of supporting that candidate, I fail to see how you can say for yourself that you are innocent in this, but everyone else is guilty. I don't believe that. Either everyone's guilty or everybody is innocent, or if you can find the actual cases of guilt where there's a quid pro quo, then we agree, that's prosecutable, right? Yeah. So, fi uh, other point. When you talked about the 2008 economy, you talked about Glass-Steagall and how this led to the crash. The real reason that the crash happened had far less to do with Glass-Steagall. I opposed the bailouts, by the way. It had far less to do with Glass-Steagall than it had to do with the fact that the federal government was actively promulgating the notion that corporations should give subprime mortgages to people who are not qualified as, as people who could take out loans. This meant that, as you say, Corporations are not inherently conservative, they're not inherently free market, they're inherently profit driven. So if they felt that they could give a bunch of subprime mortgages and this would inflate the real estate prices and if things went wrong, they just foreclose on the nearest house and the market just keeps going up and up and up and they can just, as you say, turn these into derivatives and sell them on the open market by pretending that these are all good loans because they have government backing, then of course you're going to get an inflated, overheated real estate market. But the question there is not the workings of the free market, it's the, it's the combination that you like in a mixed economy, that I hate. Okay, I hate mixed economies in the sense that I don't believe that capitalism and socialism should be mixed, that corporatism is the solution. Okay, what you're talking about is corporatism. You're talking about Glass-Steagall, which, which freed the, the, the 
getting rid of Glass-Steagall, it freed the corporations to invest in a free market manner, but also they gave a bailout to all of these corporations by essentially incentivizing them to give a bunch of bad loans, knowing that if things went bad, then all the losses would be socialized. The problem there is not the free market. The problem there is a government that is acting as a backstop for bad decisions in the free market by profit-driven corporations. The, I need to respond to some of that. Yeah, so, yeah definitely. The, okay, so first of all, I'd like to point out that Cenk's big government, small government dichotomy was proposed by you, not by me. I talk about the proper scope of the government's involvement in particular areas the same way that you do, and we may disagree on all of that. My point is that overall, if you're talking about the level of government spending, it needs to go down, and you believe that it really needs to go up. Okay, so it's disingenuous. It it's, it's not on war, does it? No, but overall. Not on over, the war okay. on drugs. Change, not on change. so many over, of those wasteful overall, programs. Overall, it overall, depends. But let me, overall let, you want you the finish. federal budget increased. Overall, I would like the federal budget, budget decreased. To pretend that this is not true is to lie. Okay, and when you suggest that there is no difference between, you know, we just have different visions of, of what the government should cover, these things cost different things. Okay, the war in Iraq was very expensive. You know what's more expensive? Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. All of these are vastly more expensive than the war in we Iraq paid and Afghanistan. Into it. Now, as far as, this, again, going back to this idea, going back to this idea that, again, I don't like this big government dichotomy any more than you do in the sense that you say, well, it's big government for the government to get inside people's wombs. And I say that it is the government's job to preserve life, liberty, and property, and one of those things is life. To protect you, to protect you from someone else taking it, okay? To protect you from someone else taking it. Now, when it comes to the idea that all money in politics is bad, again, I ask you, final, final question, you know, final point on, we're going through 10 points at a time here, but final point here. When you say money in politics is bad, again, I ask you, Buddy Romer gave you $4 million to start TYT. What did he expect in return? Should he not have given you money? Was the money not speech? It was just money, after all. It was just like a hooker, I assume. So are you the prostitute? How did this work? When you take money from Al Jazeera, okay. does that make you a hooker so for the Qataris? That How does that awesome work? Oh, great. And you think the government is in the business of regulating so, business. So, so, if the government is in the business of regulating business, what would be the problem with the government telling Buddy Romer he is not allowed to invest in your business? Hey, you because, know, you believe in education, quick, so why don't you believe in health care? Because, because it's a free country and I get to spend my money wherever I damn well please. Uh, so, you're a lawyer, so you know that bribery requires two parties to the bribe. If I give money to a politician, there must be something in return. If there is no quid pro quo, there is no bribery. Do you think there's nothing in return? Well, you, have you think the politicians don't no, do those I think, favors? I think, no, I think very often there is something in return. But I want you to point me to the things that are in return, not just say that all spending on politics ought to be forbidden except for the Young Turks. No. That is a, okay, final question. This is going to be the last word Final on thing this. here last on this, word. okay? Final question on this. So, Young Turks is super successful. We have 80 million uniques. It's, it's wonderful. Do you think Thank Bernie you. Sanders would care more if you gave him $10,000 or if you dedicated your entire network to kissing his ass for an election cycle? <laughs> I'll go first to Ben. If we look at 2020, what will be a winning message and who will be a winning candidate on the Republican side in 2020? <laughs> so... I think, that, I think that the greatest ally that the Republicans have is the incompetence and stupidity of the Democratic Party. Uh, the, the, the 2016, in fact, I have a feeling that Cenk actually might agree with me on this. The 2016 election, Donald Trump became President of the United States, right? Hillary Clinton was the worst candidate in the history of mankind. And that had, so, you know, the, the Republican message I never thought was a particularly losing message. I just think that what we have right now is such a polarized politics that it's going to be very difficult for anybody to pass anything in this climate. I also think that what, what we have almost a, a reactionary feel on both sides. Like, what I like about this debate is that we're actually talking about ideas, which is actually pretty rare in this, in this, in this sphere. Well, what's become more common is that on the left, there's this, there's this retreat to intersectionality as an identity politics. This idea that if we can cobble together a group of people who are feeling victimized by American society, you know, we have black people and we have Hispanic people and we have women and we have gays and lesbians and transgenders, and they all feel really bad about how American politics is going. And if we push that notion, we can create a coalition. There'll be a brand new coalition never before seen in American politics. And that requires a woman to run, or that requires a black woman to run, or that requires a minority to run. If they do that, then what you're going to see from, in, I think, an equally nasty way, from the right is a response that says, okay, well, if you're going to do identity politics, you will see some white identity politics from the right, which I think is really negative. 
I don't want to see either of those things. What I would like to see is the Democrats' campaign on the bigger, uh, on the on the stronger involvement of government in your life and higher taxes program that Cenk wants them to campaign on, the Bernie Sanders Elizabeth Warren program, and I would like to see the Republicans' campaign on my program, a smaller government libertarian program that says the government should get as mu out of his, our lives as much as humanly possible. All right, and for Cenk, all right, I want to respond. This, to, this is this is a ben, point. Just very quickly, in the last round. Very quick. Okay. okay? Very okay, I want to respond to a point. This is a point that Cenk made last year in his debate with Dinesh repeatedly for about an hour. That uh, was the Southern strategy with regard to the Republicans. Okay, I'd like to point out the idea that the entire South sol solidly moved into the Republican category because of the Civil Rights Act is historically false and has been debunked multiple times by people ranging from Sean Trent to Real Clear Politics to professors at the University of Pennsylvania. And there's a bunch of ways to debunk it, including the fact that the Congress did not switch Republican in the South until 1994. Okay, did it take 30 years for the racists to realize what was going on? 21 senators from the South were Democrats. How many of them became Republicans after the Civil Rights Act? The answer, one. The other 20 stayed Democrats. In 1952, Eisenhower did not win a ton of the South. Eisenhower did win, however, seven states in the South in 1956, after he sent federal troops down South. The reason that the, that the Republican Party started to win in the South, it began in the 1950s, not after the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and it was largely due to the movement of industry down South. It was new fringe members of the Republican Party, younger members of the Republican Party, who switched over to the Republican Party in the South, not old Democrats, who remained old Democrats and are still old Democrats today. Uh, so by the way, this final will be the Jimmy, Car this Jimmy will be Carter the launched his 1980 campaign at the headquarters, that town in Alabama that was the headquarters for the KKK. So to pretend that it was only yeah. Republicans playing yeah. the bad and evil right. race strategy is just so, a lie. All right. Okay, last word. Some members of the Republican